Now, it's a great pleasure to introduce your first keynote speaker of the day. He's a global thought leader in the field of customer experience. And his message is very clear. In a constantly changing world, when digital becomes human, you, as business leaders, need to play a much more active role in the life journey of your customers. Please give him some of that warm Norwegian hospitality. A warm welcome to Stephen Van Bellingham. Good morning, good morning. What a pleasure to kick off this impressive event here in, in wonderful Norway. Thank you for being here. I'm super excited that I can share my story um, when digital becomes human to all of you. And this is a story about how to become more customer centric. But before we dive into that action, I just want to give you a little personal anecdote. I'm, I'm a huge fan of robots. Uh, we have a lot of robots in our house next to the humans, of course. Um, and this is my favorite one. And I don't know if you have it, a vacuum cleaning robot, but if you have children that are like children of my age, they're uh, 11 and 13, this is a friend in the house. I mean, it eats the crumbs after breakfast, it's wonderful. But we also use this robot to raise our children. And I just wanna share my expertise in that field with all of you. So this is what we do. I push the button, that button in the middle, and then our children hear the sound effect. And it goes like this, it goes like, doo -doo. And they look at me and they said, Dad, do you, did you just release the robot? And I said, yes, yes, I just did. And then they say, our Legos are still on the floor. And then I say, I know. <laughs> you have 30 seconds left. Huh? And that works every single time. So I do doo doo and boom, they start to clean up their toys. It is amazing. So this is something that we've done for months and we really enjoyed it. But after a while, my wife and myself, we were like, hmm, this is strange because this machine has a higher level of authority over our children than we do as young parents, which was a little bit awkward. So we brainstormed about that and we decided to mentally get over it and to raise the children with the three of us. Uh, the two humans and the machine. So I can highly recommend you to do that and mentally accept that human plus machine is stronger than human alone and that's what we did. Now if you think that I'm gonna buy that robot, Stephen, this is good advice, but I only have a newborn, a baby, it's maybe too early, it is definitely not, they like them as well. Uh, but I'm, I'm a huge fan of this machine and it's basically this, mach this machine that gave me this very simple insight that in customer experience, we have to do the exact same thing as we are doing with our children today. We just need the machines for the boring part, for the operational part, and by doing so, we create time and space for the humans to do human stuff, the more emotional things. And, and that's my very simple philosophy about this talk. How can we combine the strengths of digital interfaces with the strengths of human interfaces? And, and you know, in the past, when you went to a business school, they taught you that you have to choose between operational excellence or customer intimacy, right? What you see today is that more and more companies combine the two. They use technology to be efficient, they use humans to have a more customer intimate relationship. I, I don't know if you're familiar with this company, Citizen M Hotels, maybe some of you have been there, um, and, and then it's also always a question, will you like it or hate it. I mean, you have two sides of the story. I'm a fan of Citizen M Hotels. If you haven't been there, you should try it out because it's something completely different than any other hotel. But I just have to warn you a little bit. Um, the, the rooms are like the smallest rooms on the planet. I mean, a cell in Alcatraz is bigger than a hotel room in a Citizen M Hotel, so that's warning number one. Warning number two is that the, the entire room is, is made in yeah, plastic that you can see through, so the entire room. So I don't know with your company if you go somewhere, if you have to share rooms or something like this, just know that you will get to know your colleague a little bit better during that stay. Uh, that's warning number two. Warning number three is this. During check-in, there's no human. There's just machines, like in the airport. And the traditional hotel industry, they were like, this is insane. I mean, we're the hospitality business. There has to be a friendly human there to welcome our guests. But at Citizen M, they're like, no, 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 no. Because if you go to a business hotel and you check in, what is the first thing that they give you? Usually, you get like a piece of paper and a pen, right? And then you have to write down, write down, 
all your personal information, which they already have because you made the booking online, so it's a waste of your time. It's already a little dip in the customer experience, but then it becomes worse because then you have to give that piece of paper back and that poor human has to type in that information in a computer system from the previous century. So these guys are like, this isn't bringing any value whatsoever, so we're going to remove humans in that part of the process because people just want to get into that room as soon as possible. But they did understand that you need humans for that hotel experience. Now, and you can shout this as a group to me, what, what is the most important part of a business hotel? It is... Oy, oy. This, this, the, the, we still have to work on the interactivity. What is the most important place of a business hotel? It is breakfast. breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> no one ever said breakfast on this question. This must be a Norwegian thing. Usually, I mean, all other countries in the world shout out the bar. Is what the, you guys are like breakfast. But hey, I appreciate your local preferences. Huh? In other parts of the world, they say the bar, and I tend to agree with that. But the truth is, in most business hotels, the bar is like the saddest place on the planet. There's more fun on an average funeral than in the bar of a business hotel, except in the, business, uh, in the bars of the Citizen M hotels, because they have humans there that are having the time of their life. It's like Tom Cruise in cocktail. And the bar is open 24-7, so extremely dangerous if you have an early flight. But they make it fun and engaging. And this is what they do, and I like this. They look at their processes and their interfaces in an extreme way. They ask themselves, where do humans add value? And there we're going to invest more in humans. Where do humans don't add value? We're going to cut out the humans. So they make an extreme choice. And I kind of like that. Now, remember this, that you can combine operational excellence and digital, and digital and, uh, customer intimacy in one philosophy. Now, I'm going to add something to that. And I'm going to use one of my favorite Disney films to illustrate it. This film is called Inside Out. If you haven't seen it, this is your homework for this weekend. This is a film that tells a story about a teenage girl that is changing schools, right? And you see the emotions that pop up in her mind. And if you see this film, you will understand that the person who programmed our brain made a huge mistake. Because we have five emotions, and four of them are negative. We only have one positive one, that is joy. And then we have sadness, we have anger, we have disgust, and we have fear. 80% of our emotions are negative. That's why our customers complain so much. They cannot help that. They were programmed in a wrong way. Now, remember this. What I'm going to do is I'm going to plot the inside-out story on top of it. And this is, for me, the, the summary of customer experience for the next few years. We need digital interfaces to remove the negative emotions that customers have and by doing so, we create time and space for the humans to actually make a difference. And, and this is what I learned from doing customer satisfaction research for t the first 12 years of my career. If you look at a, the results of a survey, a 10-point scale, what you see is that people never give a 9 or a 10 to a machine. People give a 9 or a 10 to an extraordinary human. They give an 8 to a machine. And what we need is technology to avoid the screw-ups, to avoid that we have the 0 to 6s, and by doing so, we create the time and the space and the goodwill for humans to make actually a difference. And that's the point where we reach that situation that I believe in when digital becomes human. Uh, and it's about understanding what the market wants. And, and for me, there's like this big paradox today. I think for companies today, it's becoming more and more complex to make customers happy. But at the same time, for me, your customer, life should become easier than ever before. And this is the challenge that we're in right now. Uh, and, I mean, look at the evolution of expectations. In the past, this is what they taught us. They told us, if you want to win, you need to be really, really good in just one thing. Just be the best in service, that compensates for everything else. Or be the cheapest one, that compensates for everything else. Or make sure you have the most beautiful store. I think you and me, all of us, we feel every single day that this no longer applies. This bar of customer expectations, bam, it went through the roof. So if you want to win, you have to score points on each of these dimensions, which means that this old marketing principle that we used to call the USP, the unique selling proposition, is broken. It's not enough to excel in one field anymore. People expect everything to be right today. Uh, and, and that's a challenge. Can we understand what brings value to customers? 
And in that perspective, this is my favorite quote. This is a quote from Larry Page, founder of Google. And he's like, guys, we have Elon Musk on the planet. And Elon with SpaceX is like launching rocket after rocket. He's releasing 50 or 60 satellites at a time. Then that rocket vertically comes back to the planet and it lands on a floating device in the middle of the ocean. We can do all that as humans. But making a toaster that doesn't burn toast, that seems to be like the hardest thing ever. Uh, and make no mistake, you know what we have in the world right now? It's what they call smart toasters. I hope none of you have a smart toaster because it's like the most ridiculous innovation in the history of mankind. Because a smart toaster, ladies and gentlemen, it sends you a text message the moment your toast is ready. In case you have forgotten what happened with that piece of bread in those 30 seconds. And then you get a text message and you're like, ah oh, yeah, it was in the toaster. I forgot. Huh? But still you get burned toast. And this is like for me what I call the internet of stupid things. We make it because technology allows us to do it, but there's not a single human in the world who actually needs a smart toaster. How can we really understand what people want? And you know, every company in this room believes that they are customer centric. Probably a lot of you have like even a slide with your four values or something or your four strategic pillars. And one of them is that you are obsessed with the customer. Question is, is it true or not? Does the customer agree? Sometimes when I meet companies, it reminds me to this security guard here. I mean, he has a slide that says safety first. Uh, he comes home and tells his wife, thank God I was there. I saved the planet. But there's a little perception gap. Huh? So, so that's basically my question to you guys. Is your customer centricity real? Is it an oasis in the desert? Or is it just something that you can see? Uh, is it a Fata Morgana? If you wonder, how do we need to look into this, Stephen? Well, you can look at your customer satisfaction data. That's all fine. But I like to use three qualitative questions that learn me so much about your culture in terms of customer experience. The first question I have for you is this. How do you react when there is an opposing interest between you and the customer? What's your reaction? Let me give you an example. Let's go to the telco industry. All telcos that I've worked with, they all have like sleeping subscriptions. People who pay a monthly fee, but don't use the service anymore. The telcos know about that. Now, if you know this, there are a number of things you can do. You can say, we're gonna let them sleep because they didn't stop their contract. We didn't do anything wrong. Or you can call them and ask them, what do you want us to do with this? Or you can call them and say, you've been paying for five years for something that you didn't use. We're gonna pay you back. So you see how this is evolving from non-customer centric to extreme customer centric. Now all telcos that I met have sleeping accounts. All telcos that I met have a, a slide that says we are customer obsessed. And all telcos that I have met choose to let the customer sleep because they want to keep the money. And this is the question, huh? are you willing to hurt yourself in the short run to gain trust in the long run? Question number one. Question number two, what kind of mindset do you have when something goes wrong? Is it a fix it mindset or a let's find out who did it mindset? And most companies have a let's find out who did it mindset. Something goes wrong and they put together like some sort of an FBI squad to find out who made the mistake. Was it the customer or was it us? Let's do research. And the research takes two or three days. In the meantime, customer becomes very nervous and says, why aren't you helping me out? Negative emotions versus something goes wrong, we're gonna fix it, and then we're gonna do our research to learn how we can improve that. What is your mindset? Huh? Some people tell me, yeah, but Stephen, but you're always fix it mindset. I mean, you don't know our customers. We have some really nasty people among our customers. Some of them will take advantage of our goodness. And I believe that. But I also learned that there's something like the 95, 5% rule in customer experience. I don't know your companies, but I'm 99% convinced that 95% of your customers are decent people, normal people like you and me. But I'm also convinced that 5% of your customers are pain in the ass people, idiots that want to take advantage of you. And, you know, and, and the truth is, most of you already know who the 5% is. And that's the problem. Our brain gives so much weight to negative customers that after a while you start to think that the 5% equals the average customer. And because of that, you start to make service rules to protect yourself against the 5%. And by doing so, you're punishing the 95%. 
A lot of companies are like the teacher that we all hated, that gives the entire classroom a punishment because there's one stupid child in the classroom. If you mentally accept that 5% of your customers are pain in the ass people, and you accept that, and you make services for the 95%, you will go to a next level of customer service. Let me show this example from Smart Photo, which is one of the largest e-commerce photo sites in Europe. They have this crazy thought that if you make a photo book with them, and you make a typo, you as the customer make a typo, and you send it to them, and you discover it as a customer when you get the book in your hands, you can tell them, and they will make a new photo book for free, because they want to give you a memory for life. And they believe that this is an extra level of service. Some of their employees were worried. They were like, we have to, we'll have to reprint half of the books. We're going to go out of business. You know, people will make a, a typo on purpose. Then they get a new book. And one of the two with a small typo, they will give it to their friends who joined them on that holiday. That's what our customers will do. After a year of trying this out, they had to reprint five photo books. Because reality is people look into the details because people want to do a good job. And sometimes people make a mistake, and then they fix it. It brings you to the next level of customer experience. And then the last question is this one. How empowered is your frontline staff? Like for me, the best example is still the Ritz-Carlton. I, I love the slogan of the Ritz-Carlton saying, we are ladies and gentlemen serving ladies and gentlemen. We're like at the same level, but giving you a high-class service. And they have their famous $2,000 rule which means that every employee, and you have to take this very literally, every employee can solve issues, compensate clients up to an amount of 2,000 US dollars. Why do they do this? Because they know that 99% of the problems can be solved within a budget of 2,000 US dollars. And they want to make sure that if you enter your room and you see that the bathroom, that maybe they forgot to clean it, and you call housekeeping, that that person on the phone can say, we will solve it. And why we solve it? Why don't you go to the bar? We'll make sure that there are two glasses of champagne on the house waiting there for you. It's instant gratification. That's what people like. And, and you can ask yourself, yeah, but why do they limit it to 2,000 US dollars? Very simple. Because if you don't, your people will not believe you. The fact that you say you can do that up to 2,000 US dollars, we encourage you to do that, feels like some sort of a safety net. It's like when you go out swimming in the ocean and they have these boundaries there, you swim all the way up to those boundaries. If they don't put them there, you only swim half that far because you're afraid that it could become dangerous. So by installing that safety net, the staff is actually executing on what you ask for. And that's question number three, how empowered is your frontline staff? And, and you know, these three questions give me a lot of information about how customer-centric you really are, and if it's an Oasis or a Fata Morgana. And also the mindset of how far do you go in terms of service delivery. I, I spend a lot of time with Google in the past few years, and every time when I go to Google, they show me this slide. And it's my favorite Google slide of all time. It's like, how far are we going? Uh, if people cannot type, if they make typos, it's our problem. If they don't speak the language, it's our problem. If the internet is not fast enough, it's our problem. And if you look at the innovations of Google, they are actually tackling this. Um, it would be fun to translate this slide to your organization. Uh, how far can you go? It's like airports who say, yeah, but the, the luggage handling, that's another company. As a customer, you don't care. I mean, it's the airline who lost it in your perception. It is their problem. And, and you know, the truth is that these are the basics of customer experience, but a lot is changing because of the digitization. Huh? More and more automation is, is putting the bar higher. AI will put the bar even up higher than it is today. I, I have the feeling that if you look at the evolution of AI, that we're like right in the middle of the adoption curve. And we know that the really cool things always happen in the second half of the curve. Huh? Just, just think back to the evolution of smartphones. Remember 2007, when Steve Jobs announced the iPhone? Do you remember the sentence that he used back then to describe the iPhone to us? He said, it will be your life in your pocket. If you look back today, I mean, this is 15 years later, this is a very accurate description. Back then, in 2007, we didn't have a clue what he was talking about. We were like, Steve, relax. It's a phone. huh?" It will be okay. It will be okay. So if you look back to how we used our smartphones back in 2007, it was for gimmicks. Do you remember what the most popular app was back in 2007? 
It was this one. I had it on my phone. It's a true embarrassment. It's the iBeer app. Most popular app 2007. It gave you a virtual beer. <laughs> and with the sensors of the iPhone, you could drink the virtual beer. And then when you put the phone down, it burped. So, I mean, it was, it was very, very low. I remember the look in my mother's eyes when I showed her this. She was like, and how much did you pay for that device? I was like, forget it. That was 2007. Today, it is a partner in life. But the truth is, if you look to the apps on the homepage of your phone, most of them did not exist before 2015. The really cool things happen in the second half of the curve. That's also the same we had with AI. Until now, it was over-promising, under-delivering. We're going to get over that point. We're going to get into that world of automation. And the consequence for the customer is zero tolerance for digital inconvenience. We're not willing to waste our precious time to your digital incompetence. That's the mindset. And, and you see how this is getting into society. I don't know if you've ever been on the Tesla website. If not, I strongly disrecommend you to go there. It's extremely dangerous. They have this order now button. <laughs> don't push it, huh? because they mean what they say. If you push order now, that's it, you have your car. Huh? I, I, by accident, when they launched this, this spacey cyber truck, I, by accident, I pushed by now, and whoops, it was already mine. So you have to be extremely, extremely cautious when you go on that site and click something. And there's still a big difference than when you go on these guys, their website. I, I'm personally a BMW fan, so I'm going to use them as the bad example. But when you go on the BMW side and when you want to play with the car configurator, you need to take half a day off. <laughs> because it is impossible to understand what you're doing. I have this feeling, like this is not for me, guys. I'm not the engineer here or the computer nerd. But AI will help us to get to a new level. Huh? And, and if you think about the possibilities, I think we're only halfway of the possibilities, also with data. I mean, for me, data is a tool to enhance customer experience. And today, we're, we're moving to a certain point but we're not at the dream level yet. These are, for me, the different steps of bringing customer value thanks to data and AI. The end goal is to have a machine that knows your context so well that the personalization is a completely different level than what we have today. Today, the problem with AI is that it's too laser-focused on the outcome. It doesn't take the context into account. Uh, let me give you a simple example. Imagine that you have a, a robot in your house, and the main goal of that robot is to bring you coffee in the morning. Then that robot will do whatever it can to stop any other person in the evening to make coffee with that machine, because it's lowering the chances of success for the robot. Or maybe even a better example. Imagine this, that you have a virtual assistant, and you ask the assistant to make you as rich as possible as soon as possible. It's a good question there's a big chance that that robot will kill your parents. <laughs> because for most of us, that is the shortest route to getting more money on our bank account. But it's not the road that we had in mind when we asked the question. Uh, so there's a need to understand the context. Today, we're not there yet. Like, when, imagine Spotify. When you use Spotify and you always listen to happy dance music, you will always get happy dance music. Even if someone died in your closed environment, Spotify will still think, this is a good day for happy dance music, Stephen. So they keep on sending me the same kind of stuff. The day that they understand my context, that's the day that they know that I need different music at that moment. That's going to be the next level, in my opinion. And, and as I said, we're not there yet. I can get so frustrated with the internet. When I book a hotel, I get like advertising for two weeks to book more rooms in that hotel. Uh, it's, for me, it's almost a reason to cancel it. Like, I already have a room. Or when you buy shoes, they always think you need 20 pairs of the same shoes. Like, I already bought them. So we, we feel the limits of the system, but the potential is out there. And it's something that is growing as we speak and is going to change customer experience significantly. But, but then the question pops up like, what, are, what, what is the role for humans in this world of AI and automation? And I think the perception here has changed in the last couple of years. Um, you know, every company that I meet has difficulties finding the right people. Um, great resignation happening in the US, quiet quitting. The never apply in the first place generation, people that don't want to work for traditional companies anymore. It's very hard to find the right people, especially in, in Europe and the US at this moment. 
And you feel how some companies are adapting to that. Like take JD. JD is, JD is the second largest e-commerce company in China. They are the master of logistics. Just before COVID hit, I, I had the pleasure to visit their headquarters. And they told me that three years ago, their average delivery time when someone orders a product online was 30 minutes. Uh, I'm from Belgium. We're far away from that. Huh? The, there's room for improvement. So I thought, wow, 30 minutes. They said, no, 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 no. No wow. They said, that's like the Middle Ages. We want to move to what we call lightning delivery. We want to deliver in five to 10 minutes. And the way that we're going to do that is by predicting what people want and then almost send it up front. I said, wow, cool. Now, these guys are coming to Europe. And their first stop is the Netherlands. And what we see is that they believe that in Western Europe, they cannot do the same business model they, because they don't find enough people who are doing those deliveries. So they completely retaught their model. So in Utrecht, in the Netherlands, they created a robotic store. And when you hear robotic store, you think, ah, like Amazon Go. But this is not like Amazon Go. Uh, Amazon Go means you walk in, you take what you want, you walk back out, and payment is done automatically. This is not what they have. It's basically linked to their app and their site. You buy anything you want. You, you, it's like Amazon, you can find everything. Then you have to go to that location. And in that location, robots actually give you the product because they don't think they can run the Chinese business model in Europe. So you see how perception is changing. Like in the past couple of years, when I talked about this topic, the number one question was this. Stephen, what will humans do when robots take away all the jobs? Today, most companies are like, Bring in the robots, uh, because we're out of humans who can do the job. So, so you feel how things are changing. And you also feel how companies are preparing themselves for a new future. Like, I had the pleasure to, to give a couple of presentations to the European Volvo team in the past couple of years, because they are going through a ma major transformation. In 2030, they want to make sure that you will only be able to buy their cars online. Now, if you own one of the dealerships and you had just invested a couple of million on a request of Volvo, that's not the best day of your career. Um, but Volvo does not want to shut down all these dealerships. They want to rethink the role of sales and service because they believe by 2030, a human salesperson will be a friction in the process to buy something. It should be so simple that a human is just a waste of time but we have to rethink the role of humans. They don't want to become Tesla. They want to use humans, but they want to do it differently. And they believe that if they want to be ready by then, that they have to start reskilling, retraining their teams as from today. You know, I'm, I'm a huge fan of, of the human aspect in the business world. I'm, I'm a big believer of this old economic law of scarcity. Now we all know this law, when something becomes scarce, it increases in value, right? Well, the, the human part in the business world is decreasing rapidly in frequency. And because of that, it is becoming more and more valuable. It's the law of scarcity. Scarcity drives value. It will be so premium in the near future to have good help from a human. The only question we need to ask ourselves is this. What do humans need to do? Where do humans need to excel in, in a world that will be super digitized? And the answer is very simple. Humans need to excel in those fields where computers are less prominent in. And then I'm talking about these real human skills like empathy and passion and creativity. And the more digital the world becomes, the more valuable these qualities will be. You know, we're like sitting in the first row of witnessing the evolution of work. In the past, most people worked with their hands. Today, most people work with their brains. In the future, if you want to make a difference as a human, we will have to start working from the heart because that is something that a machine cannot do. Our computers personalize, people make it personal. It sounds the same, but it's a huge difference. There's just one problem with humans. Like, like a machine is consistent. If you buy something from Amazon, it's always exactly the same. It's consistent, it's not warm, but it's consistent. A human can lift the experience, can make it better. But the truth is humans can also make it worse. Uh, I think we've all been in situations where you think, oh my God, I would fire this person instantly if he or she would work for me. So it's not because we are human that we're good in being human. Those are two different things, in my opinion. Uh, computers predict human surprise. When was the last time you surprised a customer when there was no deal involved? 
People like to see random acts of kindness. We need more kindness in this world. Like this guy from UPS who's cleaning the driveway somewhere in Canada, removing the snow. Why, we don't know, but it's very nice. It's very kind. And when he drives home, and his competitor from FedEx is stuck in the snow. He doesn't drive by honking and yelling, enjoy your weekend, but he helps that person out. That's what we like to see. That is human kindness. And this is my favorite one. Computers deliver, people over deliver. We need humans that color outside of the lines in favor of the customer. That's what we need. You can have processes, but make sure that you have mental flexibility that your team doesn't have to follow the rules if they can do something exceptional for customers. And it's in small things. This is not about breaking the law, this is about small things. Like a couple of years ago, I was in Universal Studios with my family in Orlando, Florida, and my oldest son was then four and a half years old. And he was already a big fan of these, of these water rides. And, and I showed him all videos I could find. I was like, two more weeks and shh, one more week, shh, tomorrow, shh. So, I mean, he, he was hyped up to go. He was ready to go. So we went to the park, straight to the ride. And as I told you, my, my marketing was really brilliant, but my research was very, very bad. Because he was like two centimeters short to get on the ride. <laughs> if you ever had a four-year-old in your life, huh? you know what happened next, right? Disaster hit us. We, we were standing there like a family of losers, basically. It was a disaster. And the guy from the park, he saw that, obviously. And he came to us and he said, look, I want to soften the pain. Here is a VIP voucher. He pulled it out of his pocket. He said, look, here is a VIP voucher. And your son can use it for the rest of his life. He will never have to wait in line again. We're going to do all kind of cool things. It will be fantastic. And I was, I was super excited. I was like, wow, uh, they have a solution for this. So at that specific moment, I took this picture for my book and my presentations. But about two seconds later, I felt that my enthusiasm was not shared by my four-year-old son. I learned that four-year-olds are more into real-time solutions. Now is an important part of their vocabulary. Huh? Not seven years from now, now. So the guy from the park was like, okay, this is not working. And if he, would be a, if he would have been a robot, this is where he would have stopped, right? This was a predefined script by people like you. A good script, but it didn't work. But he was creative, passionate, empathic. And he said, I want to help you out. Is there a ride that your son would like to go on and that he is tall enough for? I said, yes, Spider-Man. Next on the list, Spider-Man. And he said, okay, let me see what I can do. So he took his walkie-talkie and he called his friend at Spider-Man. And I could overhear that conversation. And he explained what happened. He said, this is what happened. A family of four, can you put them on the, on the right? Can they skip the line? Yeah, ah, oh, fantastic, awesome. Yeah, they're gonna be so happy with that. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'll send them over right away. Yes, yes, you will definitely recognize them because one child has a pretty bad mental breakdown right now. <laughs> Just, just put him on the ride. And you know, that's what happened and life was good again. And it's those kind of things that are typically human. This is what we need. This is what we need. And, and if I have to pull out one, it's about empathy. It's about not knowing your customer. It's about understanding your customer. Those are two different things. And, and you know, during the pandemic, I, I'm a soccer fan. I'm a fan of Club Brugge, Club Brugge. And during the pandemic, I watched a lot of games in empty soccer stadiums on TV. Maybe you have done that as well. And I thought it was the most boring thing in the world. I felt sorry for the players because they are used to work and live in a world of direct and real-time customer feedback. If they do something right, they get cheered at. If they do something wrong, they get booed at. A lot of companies take decisions in empty soccer stadiums without the direct feedback of customers. Have you ever imagined how you would change your own behavior if you would have like a little earpiece with direct and real-time customer feedback. So imagine you're writing an email to a customer and it's not super friendly and you already hear the booze in your ear like, whoa, losers. Huh? Then you think, delete, 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 I have to do something else. Or when you're super, super friendly that you hear the cheering and you think, oh, I'm going to do something more here. How would you change your behavior? Truth is that we're taking way too many decisions in empty soccer stadiums. We look at Excel sheets and before we know it, we're just dehumanizing 
our customers. Huh? You, you don't build empathy by reading a market research report. You build empathy by listening to your customers, making the time for them. And I think this is what we need. And if we really understand what they need, we can take the customer relationship to a new other human level. I, I want to show you this example from an insurance company from the Netherlands, Centraal Beheer. It's part of the Agmea group. And, and you know, if I ask people how to describe their relationship with an insurance company, usually they're silent. They're saying non-existing. Some say it's a billing relationship. Every year I get my invoice and that's it. And most insurance companies, they want to go beyond the billing relationship. And Central Behavior was thinking, can we do something with our car insurance clients that, that's bringing value to them? And then they looked at the behavior of customers and they learned that there are a lot of people, me included, that bump into things with their car. And then you have like a little scratch or a little dent in the car. And what do most people do when you have a little scratch on your car? Nothing. Because they don't want to spend time and money on that. So your once so beautiful car is not so beautiful anymore because of all the small scratches. So Central Beheer was thinking, why don't we organize little scratch days? And every year they organize little scratch days on multiple locations in the Netherlands and Central Beheer customers can go there for free and they repair that. And the people who welcome you during that event are employees from Central Beheer, but not the customer service team, but people who work in the back end, people from IT, people from accounting, those kind of people that usually don't see and hear customers in their day-to-day -day job, they go to those places and welcome them. They have to make cake and pie for them. They have their Central Beheer band who's playing there. It's like a party, the, the warmth of the Netherlands. But it's for me an example of a company who understands a certain need, brings it to the market in a super, super human way. And by doing so, you go over that billing relationship. You invest in these kind of qualities and, and, and really be serious about it. Now, I have an invitation for you. If you go back to the office on Friday, probably, and you overhear a conversation of your colleagues who are talking about customers, and you hear that these four annoying characters, remember them, that these four annoying characters are taking over the meeting, I invite you to walk up to them and say, dear colleagues, what would Joy do? And I can guarantee you, the more decisions Joy can take in your organization, the higher your points will be on the human level, and the closer you will get to the point where digital becomes human. I'm approaching the, the end of my talk, and I just want to put a few things together to, to put them in a different perspective. Well, just a simple question. What is the scarcest resource of your customers? It is, I didn't announce it, this is a second interactive moment <laughs> uh, where you can shout out something. I'm already very curious what you will shout out uh, after the little break breakfast incident we had earlier. What is the scarcest resource? Ah, here we go. Norway is with us. Time is the scarcest resource. Now, if you know this, the question is, how do you manage the time of your customers? Because there are two things that you can do with the time of your customers. You can help them to save out time, increase the efficiency, and you can help them to enhance the time. And some companies are better in one or the other, like Disney wants to give you a good time, technology companies, they want to save out time. Some try to do both. Like, I'm a huge fan of the skip intro button of Netflix. Do you know that one? Every time I push it, I'm like, yes, 30 seconds saved. And then I give two hours back to Netflix. Uh, that's the deal that we have. <laughs> But the interesting thing is that you're starting to see how companies like Disney invest in technology to make park visits more efficient with bracelets, with apps. You see how companies like McDonald's and Domino's Pizza completely reinvented the way that you buy stuff to make it more efficient. And, and the opportunity is this, that most companies don't think like this. They just ask themselves, how can we sell more stuff? And you guys have been here in this exclusive session for this group. You know better now. You know that by removing small frictions, making it easy, becoming a friction hunter, and I'm going to talk more about that this afternoon, but if you become a friction hunter and you remove all kinds of frictions, you save time of your customers. And if you let joy make more and more decisions, 
you create more warmth and enhance that relationship. And that's a different way of looking to the market. Most of your competitors, they just think, how can we sell more stuff? You guys think, how can we be more respectful for the time of customers? And if you make decisions from this point of view, it will be a completely different end result. The future of customer relations. Um, in my opinion, we're going through a double transformation. It's not just digital transformation. It's at the same time a human transformation. It's both, and it's not, not one after the other. It's both at the same time. The digital transformation means that we're going through a human transformation. Our skills need to change. And if we invest in both of those axes, and if we combine the strengths of digital interfaces with the strength of human interfaces, that is the moment when we reach the point when digital becomes human. And that's what I wanted to share as the kickoff of this beautiful Oslo Business Forum. Um, if you like my work, you're always welcome to check me out on my social channels, on YouTube or Instagram or LinkedIn. I share a lot of content there. We have some time for questions. But for now, thank you so much for listening to my opening talk. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. What a fascinating ride. Do you need a sip of water? I'm going to take a sip of water. That was fascinating. I was just thinking, um, listening to your keynote, for the last couple of years, so many businesses have just been told again and again to invest in the digital transformation and a lot of focused on AI. But what would you say, after we heard this, what is the biggest mistake a lot of companies do when they think about investing in new technology? Well, I, I, and this may sound strange, but I think there's an overfocus on the technology itself mm -hmm. and less on the outcome. I think the guiding star should be what kind of customer benefits can we create? And typically, technology can create benefits like faster than real-time service, more personalization, more convenience. And when you start from a customer point of view, I think that if you reverse engineer that, that you can come up with maybe 10 or 15 small projects instead of this one monster that you create. And that's a mistake that I've seen in many companies. They get overexcited about the technology. They start a project that takes so much time and money that it's taking 12 months to implement, and then there's disappointment. I'm a much bigger believer in smaller steps and growing into it than having the one magical project that will make a difference. You talked about how time is valuable for our customers, for all of us. And I'm just looking out at all of you. How many have tried this AI customer service where you're calling someone and you're sitting there and press eight for this, press six for this, and you're kind of getting desperate, just like one of the questions here, to actually get to, through to a human to get help. How many of you have tried that in here? Can I see a show of hands? Everyone, I assume. Huh? Basically, right? So when we say we invest in this to make time more valuable for our customers, to give better customer experience, this is actually what we experience right now, so, right? Yeah, absolutely. So what is, what, is, what is it that they actually need to learn today when we think about transforming those two things going ahead? I think step number one is that everyone in the leadership function should call their own contact center. Did you ever think about that? If, if a CEO of a, of a bank loses her credit card, mm -hmm. what happens? Will she call the contact center or will she call her assistant and say, I lost my credit card, can I get a new one? Can you fix it? Yes. Can you fix that? So usually <laughs> when you're in a leadership function, you have a shortcut to solving your own problems. I think step number one is go through the process that an average customer is going through and then you will find out so many things that you're doing wrong that that are often quick fixes. And the second thing is, I, I've seen so many companies, especially after COVID, th that have had an increase in, in questions from customers, and then the solution is we need more customer service people. But they don't solve the problems behind it. It's like when you have to clean a river, and you think oh, there's more and more garbage coming, we need more people to get the garbage out. You can also go like 300 meters upstream and, make, and build a wall that there's not that much garbage getting into the river. And, and that's the second one that we need to work on. Don't put more customer service people in, just learn from them and solve all the questions that keep coming back. A question just came in that said that a lot of companies outsource their customer service and miss out on meeting their customers. What advice would you give them? Well, the, 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 it's, it's absolutely true. Yeah? You have two kinds of companies, companies that do everything in-house and you have companies who outsource things. I'm, I'm not by definition against outsourcing because very often you have a professional team, you have uh, access to more people. 
but you cannot build, let's say, a, 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 a brick wall in between you and that supplier. That contact center almost then, even if it's outsourced, should become part of your organization. And make sure that people from your marketing team spend time there, listen to those requests, and see what they can do with it. If you just put it aside and never look to it, then, I mean, then you cannot improve your own service. Another question I was thinking about, you said, try not to just think about, I need to sell more stuff. Basically, you have to sell the experience. Um, and what you just showed us is storytelling. Mm -hmm. If you're sitting out there thinking about that message, it requires a lot of storytelling. What would you be your advice in how to actually get into that approach on how to do the best storytelling of your company? Yeah, there are a number of things. Huh? Usually when we want to do storytelling, a lot of people focus on the product. For, make a rule that it's not about the product. And try to go back to the start of the company. Ask yourself, why did we start this company? Or why did someone start this company so many years ago? What was the story back then? And go back to those roots, but because very often there's a really cool story there. And if you can find you know, related things that are more happening in this time, back to that story, you already have something good. And the second thing is, use your employees. I mean, inside a company, it's like a soap series, no? You have people working on things, you have different scenarios happening. Tell the story of your employees, how, how passionate they are, and then other people will follow the passion of your team. And you said passion and you said empathy. So my final question is, you said, a lot of companies need that empathy to come through to the customers. But backstage, you also told me a lot of CEOs say they're always looking for more employees that have empathy. How do I get them, Steve? What do you normally answer them? Well, uh, th there's no secret place where you can find empathic people. Um, there's no bus somewhere driving around that you need to hijack. It, it basically all depends on leadership. I'm going to compare it again with, with playing football. Sometimes you have this great soccer player. He moves to another team and it feels like he cannot play anymore. Is that the mistake of the player or is it because of the context that that person arrives in? If you have two companies that are selling, uh, selling shoes and one is really known for being friendly and the other is not known for that, if one of the friendly companies employees moves to the other one, you will see that their level of friendliness is decreasing and the other way around. So it depends on the context that you install as a leader if people will behave empathic. You cannot find them. You have to install a culture of empathy. It has to come from the top. Yeah, absolutely. Before we say goodbye to you, there's someone who's saying here, have you considered upgrading your vacuum bot to one that also mops the floor? Not yet, but that's, that's fantastic <laughs> advice. Thank you for that. You can bring that along with you. Yeah. We'll see Steve later today, but let's give him a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much.